Welcome to my Chanel. A place that brings interesting and dramatic stories. Hope you have a fun experience. Please listen to the next story. In brief, I've been married to my wife for 11 years, and we have two kids aged 11 and 9. She was unfaithful for 8 months and I found out about it during the last 3 months. I didn't approach her until I had gathered proof, including video evidence, and had a separation agreement prepared by a reliable lawyer. This happened about 9 months ago, which I suppose is what's referred to as D-Day in this context. I waited for her to return home from being with her affair partner, and she was completely unaware that I had any knowledge of the situation. The moment she noticed me sitting at the table, she became very anxious. I asked her to take a seat because we needed to have a conversation. I had already shed all my tears by now and didn't really care anymore. I had already made up my mind about divorce from the very day I first learned about her affair. My wife sat down looking extremely worried wife. You're scaring me. What's going on? Me. I'm not here to discuss your cheating. I know everything. I'm here to work on our separation and divorce. I placed my wedding ring on the folder containing the separation agreement and slid it in front of the wife started crying, begging, apologizing, and pleading. All the usual reactions, we didn't make any progress. I just rejected whatever she said. Wife. I love you. Me. You hurt me more than I've ever been hurt. And you sleep with other men because you love me so much. After a couple of hours, I suggest that she should stay at a hotel, and we can continue our discussion the next day. I let her know that if she doesn't sign the separation agreement, I will reveal her actions to everyone today. I understand it might be seen as signed under pressure. But at that moment, I just wanted it to be over. Eventually, she agrees to sign. She leaves, and I receive messages and calls throughout the night. I respond occasionally with short answers like, I won't read this message or talk to you until tomorrow afternoon. The following day, the seriousness of the situation seems to have sunk in for her. She pleads for another chance, suggesting marriage counseling and making promises to do whatever it takes. I inform her that I plan to file for divorce on Monday and that she has 90 days to convince me that ending the marriage is a mistake. I'm not sure why I offered that. Perhaps I was feeling vulnerable as I had already decided to end things. Yet I gave in. On the next day, I've prepared a list of requirements for her. Though I don't show it to her directly, I just inform her about the existence of the list and explain that unless she follows it, we will only communicate about the kids and the divorce will proceed without hesitation. With me revealing her actions to everyone, I also let her know that even if she complied perfectly, it didn't guarantee we wouldn't divorce. My trust in her was rock bottom, and my feelings of love were gone. The only reason I even considered working things out was for the sake of our kids. I didn't mean to express this, but once again, I couldn't stick to my initial decision. The list included the following requirements. 1. She needed to create a detailed account of her actions with him, explaining how it began, what led her to justify her actions to both me and our children. If she tried to emit or gloss over anything, my efforts for reconciliation would end too. She had to grant me full access to her social media, phones, computer, her earnings, and bank statements. 3. She was required to provide regular updates on her whereabouts and activities. 4. 4. She would attend individual counseling sessions two, three times a week until she gained insight into her own decisions. Couples counseling would come later. She agreed to these terms, compiled the list, and granted me access. Afterwards, I revealed points 5, 6, and 7 in sequence. Only after she completed each task. 5. She was required to meet App's wife in person, confess everything, provide all evidence, and offered to testify in court if necessary. Initially, she resisted claiming she couldn't bring herself to do that to him. I pointed out that she prioritized App's feelings over her own family's well-being. I made it clear that if she didn't comply, the attempt at reconciliation was over. I was ready to inform App's wife myself if she refused. If she didn't take responsibility, I wouldn't consider reconciling. Eventually, 
she reluctantly agreed and confessed everything to Ap's wife. Ap's wife reacted angrily, slapping, kicking, and pulling her hair. Despite the assault, my wife didn't fight back, and I didn't intervene to protect her. She ended up with cuts and bald spots. Later in the car, I revealed that AP had been involved with another woman besides my wife and showed her the evidence gathered by the private investigator I had hired. I admit feeling a sense of shame for finding satisfaction and witnessing her anguish as she realized she was just another conquest to this guy. 5. She had to talk to our kids and explain the likely consequences for our family. 6. She needed to confess her actions to our family and friends. 7. I decided to have a three-month affair lying to her and engaging in secretive behavior. I would emotionally connect with another woman during this time. I wanted her to comprehend the pain and humiliation of what she had asked me to forgive. I wanted her to realize the risk of me falling in love with my AP and leaving her. After three months, I would truthfully disclose everything to her. Number seven was particularly difficult for both of us. I pretended to cheat using Tinder and showing it to her occasionally. I acted like I was secretly texting someone. I would disappear for entire nights weekends. Although in reality, I wasn't seeing anyone. I stayed in hotels, rented cabins, and Airbnb accommodations. Most of the time, I would just get drunk and cry. Wife was getting more and more anxious and I felt awful too. I hated it. I mean, I was just pretending but even that was hard. She seemed to handle it so effortlessly. I think the most challenging part for me is how I can't see her the same way anymore. I wanted to show her what she wanted me to forgive, but instead, I realized how terrible it is to do something like this to another person. We're in marriage counseling now, and she's making some progress, but I'm struggling more. Some days are tougher than others, I guess. I've got the divorce papers ready. Though I haven't taken that step yet. I'm not entirely sure why I haven't. We're not as distant as we used to be, and at least we're not arguing. So I suppose that's progress. She's really sorry, and I know we've got a long road ahead. Who knows where we'll end up? I can't shake off how awful I felt pretending while she handled it so easily. It's hard for me to see her positively now. I see her more like a monster. Sometimes, I wish I had ended things on the very first day. But now we've both come so far. Is there any way for me to change how I see her? I've forgiven the other aspects, but I'm just stuck on this one thing. Edit. I finally told her that I hadn't actually been seeing anyone after just seven weeks. I couldn't keep up the act. It made me feel terrible. Update. My wife and I were up all night after I showed her the post yesterday. Here's an update with some thoughts and reflections. We understand our chances of success are really low, and it might take many years to get through the worst of it. But this morning, we both agreed that we're committed to giving it a try. She was completely devastated by some of the things I said in many of the comments. Still, in the end, we managed to have a genuine conversation, even though we don't always succeed at that. To everyone who spoke to me with strong opinions, being in the middle of something like this is completely different from looking at it from the outside. Nothing is clear or easy. Emotions are overwhelming, and even getting up in the morning to face a new day feels almost impossible. If I were to try to explain how difficult it is to think clearly and make good choices, let me give you this analogy. Imagine you're living your life standing on top of a mountain. You can see all around you to the horizon with no doubts. Your mind and thoughts are clear. You know who you are, what you want, and where you want to go. Imagine suddenly being pulled from the top of the mountain shoved into a dark, sealed box and spun around so fast that all your blood rushes to your legs. You're on the verge of passing out. Your thinking is clouded and you're overwhelmed with nausea and dizziness. You do anything to stop feeling like you're about to throw up. This is the closest I can come to explaining the intense trauma my mind went through. In such a state, it's inevitable to make some poor decisions. I believe anyone would make mistakes in this kind of condition. To those who were saying we were harming our children, we disagree. We spoke to our kids, and they're actually thankful that we've been open with them and included them in our efforts. As my youngest put it, it's my family too. 
they have more faith in us than we do and appreciate that we ask for their advice and thoughts. We've been careful to assure them that we won't let them be put in the middle. We've also made it clear that none of this is their responsibility or fault. They've expressed that they like being part of the process, and supporting both of us. They offer kind words and extra hugs when they sense we need it. They understand that fixing things might not be possible. But they've made it clear that they'll feel let down if we don't give it a proper try. The initial months were incredibly stressful. But one thing settled. They became really appreciative of being included. Unlike some of their friends whose families are falling apart, they're grateful for not being kept in the dark. So it seems our kids are in a better situation than we are. I just hope we don't disappoint them too much. To those who thought I was crazy and questioned how I could be tough on my wife while talking reconciliation. Just to clarify on the day everything came out, I didn't plan on offering anything. My initial intention was to end it quickly even when she came back the next day, begging for a chance and offering anything. I still intended to end things, but in that moment, I couldn't go through with it. I couldn't walk away from her. I felt weak, ashamed, and angry. I wanted her to feel the pain I felt. But deep down, I still had feelings for her. Even though I couldn't admit it or end things. After some reflection, I made the list and laid out my conditions. I never imagined she'd agree to the toughest terms. I didn't expect her to confess to the app's wife, tell our kids, families, and friends, and I definitely didn't anticipate her standing by me during my pretend revenge affair. Honestly, I hope she'd give up. But I also wanted her to experience some suffering. I believed her suffering would somehow make me feel better. It didn't. As she did everything I requested, I couldn't deny any longer that she was genuinely sincere wanting to fix things and deeply regretful for her actions. She's been putting her all into reconciling. Sadly, I haven't been doing the same. I've been looking for reasons to give up and walk away. Or trying to push her into giving up and leaving. There were moments when I was terribly cruel, unleashing my anger on her. I admit I can be intimidating. Remarkably, she's taken it all without making excuses. She doesn't try to defend herself. She just absorbs it. She told me she's never been afraid of me but I'm not entirely convinced. She believes I'd never physically harm her. Though I'm not so certain. There have been times when I've come close. I really hope I never ever cross that line. I'm genuinely scared that I might cause serious harm or even destroy someone. For those who asked about her reasons for doing it, we've come to realize that she felt stuck and suffocated. Our life was too safe and predictable. After her best friend's death, she felt lost, and she became vulnerable to someone manipulative who knew exactly. To reconcile her choices with the person she believed she was. We've discovered that this was a pattern with her affair partner. He had been cheating on his wife with two, three other women, even before they started dating. We also found out that he has two illegitimate sons. As for me, I hadn't fully committed to reconciliation. I'm a tough person capable of both enduring and delivering. I convinced myself that I'd find solace if my wife experienced suffering. I was open to walking away if I found a compelling reason. I was mistaken. I've been seeking reasons to keep my distance from her, still carrying deep wounds. Fear of getting close and hurt again held me back. This reluctance hindered our progress toward reconciliation. She's been the sole one fully invested. Some wondered if I could give love as effectively as I could punishment, and the truth is I can't. But I'm actively working on changing that now. While I've forgiven her, I've been keeping her at arm's length attempting to find a reason strong enough to override my love for her so I could leave. I'll shift that approach and genuinely put an effort to reconcile. If we don't succeed, at least I'll know I tried my best moving forward. Even if it means risking. Responsible for handling the fallout from her poor choices. A role I didn't seek. I've spent a lot of time pondering this situation. I'm not exempt from making mistakes either. There are moments when I act irrationally and treat her extremely harshly. 
My urge to punish her has consumed me with hatred and anger sometimes uncontrollably. Like her, I've lost control and made poor choices. We're both just human. I need to find ways for us to move beyond this together. I'll step down from my high horse and make an effort to contribute equally 50% to this relationship and our efforts to mend it. Regarding my wife, the day after D-Day, she realized the extent of the damage I suffered. There was no escaping it, no room for forgiveness, just emptiness. She understood that saving our family was a slim chance, but she was willing to do anything to try. It's evident now that she never truly loved AP. She was drawn to the excitement, the illusion. She expressed gratitude for my unwavering and resolute approach. It snapped her out of the affair. Hayes brought her back to her senses and refocused her on what truly matters. She believed her punishment was deserved. And it prevented her from hating herself as much. She's thanked me profusely for not letting her off the hook for pushing through. She's been harder on herself than I ever was. And she even contemplated ending her own life at one point, though she refrained because it seemed like an easy way out. I discovered that she's been harming herself since D-Day hitting and pinching herself. Her legs completely covered in shades of purple, a continuous black mark. It's not helping though. We've agreed that her focus needs to shift towards forgiving herself. Our healing can't begin until that happens. It's a bit strange. Now that she set on punishing herself, she's lost all those qualities that initially drew me to her. Her sense of humor, her smile, her well-thought-out opinions, her self-esteem, her loving patience, they've all faded. I find it difficult to rekindle my feelings for her when she's suppressing the very things that made me love her in first place the qualities that led me to be with her, and marry her. All in all, we've made some progress, thanks to the kind strangers on the internet. There's still a long road ahead, but we've pinpointed some major obstacles to overcome. We actually slept in the same bed for the first time since D-Day, so that's a step. It felt nice to be next to her again. I still have love for her, and it's a bit tough to accept. But then I think about my kids and it gives me the strength to persevere. We'll strive to build something new since the old relationship is no longer here. Update. This will be my final activity on this account as it has fulfilled its purpose. And I'm incredibly thankful for all the help I've received from everyone. There were times when it felt overwhelming, but I'm all right. Well, I should say we are all right. Ever since I committed fully to reconciling, there's been a remarkable improvement. We've even started reconnecting a bit. My wife or rather the version of my wife I fell in love with is starting to emerge more and more. We've been attending therapy sessions and making significant progress in our communication. We've also resumed being close regularly. While it's still early days and the odds may not be in our favor, we're making surprisingly positive strides. I'm making an effort to show my appreciation for her every day, and she's doing the same. Although there are moments of intense emotional pain for both of us, overall, we're experiencing more good times than bad. I believe we'll be all right. Our kids are doing well, and I have hope for the future. Update. I've received requests for an update. We're currently living apart. Initially, our reconciliation efforts were going well, and my wife did her part right. However, she's struggling to forgive herself and has a lot of self-hatred. On the other hand, I managed to hide my emotions for a while. The issue is that beneath the surface, my feelings were still simmering. Feelings of immaculation, betrayal, lies, humiliation and anger were all bubbling underneath. As a result, I regressed into being mean, vindictive, and angry and I'm no longer interested in being that kind of person. So we decided to separate to give ourselves some space. We might attempt reconciliation again later for the kids' sake, that's where things stand. Sometimes it's just not possible to fix things completely. I'm not very optimistic about us making it in the end. My wife who's 35 and we've been married for two years was a college professor for a while when this story happened. She worked really hard to land this job, and she had every reason to be proud. Her parents were definitely impressed. She threw a big celebration for her graduation and new job, and the whole family was in town for it. 
We even delayed our marriage as per her request so she could secure her dream job. This job was her whole deal, and I couldn't picture her doing anything to mess it up for us. But I wouldn't be talking to you today if she hadn't. She got close pals with a few of her students. They were around their late 20s, so they were pretty close in age. Still, it struck me as kinda odd that she was buddies with them while also being their professor. It didn't feel very professional, but I held back from sharing my thoughts. Apparently, she joined in on some of their get-togethers, or at least that's how she described them, more like laid-back hangouts than actual parties. She mentioned they even talked about some class topics with her because her students were super passionate and focused. I just let it go on. I really wish I had tried to talk her out of blending her dream job with enjoyment, but she was just so thrilled. She truly felt on cloud nine and believed she was making a reel on their lives. She always got back home at a reasonable hour because she didn't want to leave me by myself all night, and she didn't go out more than twice a month. I could sense something was off. When she stayed out until 2 a.m., I was awake, waiting, and that led to a big argument. She claimed she was only assisting her students, but that explanation wasn't cutting it for me. I insisted on getting to the bottom of things, but she stuck to her story. I asked her to take a break from hanging out with students for a bit, and that set her off. She accused me of being controlling and started crying. She said she was a responsible woman who deserved to have her own life, especially when she found someone who brought her such joy. My eyes widened. She quickly backtracked saying she got her words mixed up because I was confronting her and she was exhausted. I was really bothered by her mix-up. But I didn't have the energy to keep arguing that night. I couldn't even bring up the idea of her taking time off from work. I didn't know how or when I could bring up the topic again. I knew I should have acted, but I decided to hold off and see what else she'd do. Things settled down for a bit. She stopped staying out late and only went to work and back home. It seemed good, although she had to grade papers at home, so I gave her space to do that. Then I caught her texting someone and it startled her. It struck me as odd, but I didn't make a fuss about it. I thought about checking her phone later, but it had a passcode. I planned to create an opportunity for her to bring students over to our place, while I'd be secretly nearby keeping an eye out. I needed to figure out who these people were and if there was something more to it. She fell from my plan really fast. As soon as I mentioned spending an evening with my mom at the nursing home, she got excited. She called me sweet for doing it, offered to give me a ride, and said she'd pick me up later to throw me off. I agreed and headed back to the house. It took about 20 minutes. I wasn't sure what I'd discover, but I found it hard to believe my wife would do anything shady a few times. I almost convinced myself I was being paranoid and started heading back to my mom's place, but then I changed my mind and turned back. When I reached the spot, I noticed a different car parked at her house. She thought she had all the time in the world to do a thing and then swing by to pick me up. Seeing that strange car got me all fired up, and I dashed to the front door. My hands were trembling as I unlocked it and saw the unsettling sight I'd ever witnessed. My wife was getting close with her student. Not even fully dressed yet. I quickly took a picture. You know, we're in a high-tech era nowadays. I had my phone out when I saw the unfamiliar car so I could snap a photo of whatever my wife was up to. Just in case things were innocent, I might have seemed like the crazy one. But now the reality started to hit me as she began to react after getting dressed and her student took off. She started yelling things I couldn't even catch. While my head felt like it was about to explode. All I could hear was my own heartbeat as I thought about how our our marriage was done for and the future I had envisioned with her was a false dream. Her career was in ruins. She'd never get another chance to teach at that school. The next school would want to know why she got the boot from this one. I snapped out of my days and demanded to know why she risked everything she had worked so damn hard to bill one of her very first students. She just stared at me with a blank expression, then spilled that he had invited her to hang out, and she hadn't thought anything bad would go down. I lost it and started yelling, telling her that something seriously messed up had indeed gone down. She brought him to our place and things got intimate. She started giving me the finger and shouting back, 
insisting it wasn't her fault and that I'd interrupted them so it shouldn't even count. My jaw practically hit the floor. I let her know that her logic was so absurd that I couldn't even argue with it. I packed my stuff and got a hotel room. I wasn't in the mood to argue with her anymore that night about who should leave. It was like I was dealing with a spoiled kid who thought she could get away with this because of all her past achievements. I wasn't about to stick around, and I wasn't going to let her hold on to her job either. I filed for divorce and sent the photo to the college president just like I figured. And she got canned. She despised me and couldn't even look me in the eye whenever we crossed paths. I never saw her eyes again. She went from being this confident, flawless, high-achieving woman to someone filled with shame and disgrace. Even her parents couldn't wrap their heads around it and actually asked me to send them the picture. I did it, although I wasn't really into it. They said, sorry to me. My wife wasn't working for any colleges in our state. After waiting for a few years, she moved out of state, maybe because she couldn't find a job no matter where she tried. I've started dating again, but I'm not going to be quick to trust someone's personality or assume they'll always be honest. My day kicked off just like any other regular day. Woke up early, got myself cleaned up, gave a goodbye kiss to Emily while she was still asleep, and headed to my construction job. But little did I know there was something unexpected waiting for me. That usual day turned into something way more extraordinary. Later in the evening, while I was at the construction site working, I felt my phone buzzing in my pocket. I pulled it out and saw a message from my neighbor Mike. He said, Dustin, your garage door is open. This struck me as odd since I distinctly remember closing it. I thanked Mike and asked if he could shut it if he didn't mind. He agreed and I went back to my tasks. However, that open garage door kept bothering me. I wasn't sure why, but something felt off. Trusting my gut, I decided to take an early lunch break and drove back home. As I got closer to my house, my heart rate started picking up. I noticed an unfamiliar car parked in my driveway. A car I'd never seen before. In that moment, a sickening feeling washed over me. I quietly parked my truck on the street and approached my own house without making any noise. I quietly opened the side door leading to the garage. And to my surprise, it wasn't locked. The door that connected the garage to the house was unlocked too. Walking through the house without my shoes, I came across the most heartbreaking scene. My wife, Emily, in the arms of a stranger. They were locked in a kiss with hardly any clothes on right there in front of me. Rage consumed me, and everything turned hazy, making me feel like I was about to be sick. Stepping back a bit I grabbed my phone, made sure the flash was off, and took a few photos of them kissing. I also recorded a quick video of them together in my own house. In that instant, it dawned on me that seeking revenge wouldn't bring me any real satisfaction. The best way to hit back at Emily was to make her fully realize what she was throwing away. It was time for a smart plan, one that would help me come out of this situation with my self-respect intact, despite witnessing what I did. I paused to catch my breath. Then quietly left the house. My heart feeling heavy like a lead weight, but with a strategy taking shape in my mind. I decided to reach out to a friend who happened to be a lawyer. I spilled the whole story to him and asked for his advice, considering we were in North Carolina. I needed some proof to possibly lower the alimony I might have to pay. Armed with the evidence, I showed it to my lawyer buddy, even though he wasn't a divorce attorney. He pointed me in the right direction and helped me understand the necessary steps to safeguard myself. He gave me the contact info for a respected divorce lawyer who could help me out. He said she was really good. When I met with the divorce lawyer, I didn't beat around the bush. I spilled all the details. She explained that North Carolina was a no-fault state, but cheating could affect alimony payments for the spouse getting support. We got the divorce paperwork sorted and talked about our plan moving forward. Emily had no clue what was going down. Few days later, my lawyer and I set up a meeting with Emily at a local cafe. She looked surprised to see me there. Her eyes wide with confusion and asked, Dustin, what's happening? 
I pushed the divorce papers across the table and her expression went from puzzled to shocked. She stammered Dustin, I don't get it. I looked at her, my heart aching and said, Emily, I think you do. I saw you with him. Her face turned pale, and I could tell she was getting it. Tears rolled down her cheeks as she said, sorry, even though she was hurting. I knew I was making the right call. Over time, Emily refused to sign the divorce papers. By then, I'd already moved out of our place and found a small apartment for myself. Since the house belonged to Emily's parents, I wasn't worried about that. The day after she got the divorce papers, her parents stepped in and offered her financial help to hire her own lawyer. However, her parents didn't have a clue about why I was divorcing their daughter, and I figured Emily wouldn't spill the beans either. That's why I made up my mind to share the photos and video I took when I caught her with that guy in our house. I sent a package to her folks explaining why I was divorcing their daughter. After around six weeks, when the divorce hearing rolled around, her parents didn't show up. My lawyer told me she was going to try asking for alimony. She mentioned it probably wouldn't work, but she wanted to keep me in the loop. After hearing what my wife's lawyer said on her behalf, they alleged I wasn't a good provider and had been offensive in court. My wife just kept spinning lies. At one point, the judge cautioned her about telling the truth in court warning that lying could get her into trouble, which is exactly what she was doing. Luckily, we presented the evidence to the judge and he granted me the divorce without giving her any alimony. The judge gave me precisely 30 days to gather the rest of my stuff from the house. I only had a couple of boxes left to pick up. Around three months after the divorce was finalized, I sorted out plans to get my things as I pulled into the driveway. I spotted the same car that Guy drove parked there. Seeing his car initially stung, but that feeling faded fast. This time, the garage door was intentionally left open for me to collect my stuff. Emily had messaged me, suggesting that we meet up sometime, and I received that message one day. I agreed wondering what she wanted to talk about. We had our initial meetup at the same restaurant where I had handed her the divorce papers earlier. She didn't seem like the confident and content woman she used to be. Instead, she looked like a pale shadow of her former self. She started talking, sharing how tough life had become for her. She expressed remorse for her choices and admitted missing me a lot. Despite this, her words didn't affect me much. I felt distant and uninterested in her explanations. I stayed quiet during her whole speech. When she finished, I turned to her and said, Emily, I hope things work out for you. But that part of my life is history now. Even after I made it clear that my decision was final, she kept trying to change my mind. She told me she was done with the other person and wanted us to reunite. As I walked away from the coffee shop, I had a realization. I had come out on top. Not because Emily was sorry or upset, but because I had found a sense of contentment within myself. My life had turned around. And I had discovered my inner strength and moved forward with my life. I started my life anew slowly piecing it back together step by step. The most satisfying revenge wasn't about getting physical or causing public humiliation. It was about moving forward with more strength and wisdom than I had before. After around seven months, Emily's father passed away due to cancer. He never showed any remorse for his initial anger when he found out about our divorce. On the other hand, her mother did apologize and invited me to the funeral. I was considering skipping it, but I didn't hold any grudges against her mother. I'm not the type to hold on to ill feelings towards others. The past can't be altered. As time went on, Rumors started circulating that Emily was sinking even deeper into legal trouble as things kept spiraling. She got arrested for drunk driving on a weekend, and her current partner was involved in shady dealings. Including trafficking pills from her mom's place. How did I find all this out? Her mother still reaches out to me occasionally. Our marriage only lasted eight years before ending. This means she might have been entitled to spousal support for about half of that time. However, she went through with it anyway, and that had an impact on the outcome that was reached.